Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, today we have Konstantin Batygin, and uh, he's going to tell us about Planet Nine. So Konstantin is a professor at Caltech, but that that doesn't matter. He has a rock band, so you should definitely listen to it. So we, I'm just trying to tell nice things about speakers, kind of find something unusual. So yeah, please. Uh, so you can you can begin. Take it away. All right. Thanks very much. Let me just take a quick moment. So it's. I'm in one of these like Zoom hell moments when the mouse has disappeared and the thing that says got it is floating. Aha, okay, I turned it off. All right, so listen, uh, I really, really appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with you all today. Um, you know, seeing some familiar faces, some people who I know only through publications and uh, seeing some people I have never met before as well. So thanks for the opportunity. And indeed, today, um, you know, I will prevent myself from talking about my band. Uh, and instead, we'll talk about Planet Nine. And I think that, you know, it's for a talk, um, you know, like this, it's always kind of key to, uh, to start out by noting that we really do live in a special time, right? We live in an era of large scale discovery of planets outside of our solar system, extrasolar planets. And uh, this was kind of you know, highlighted perhaps so a few years ago when uh, these two uh, gentlemen from Switzerland got the, the Nobel Prize for the discovery of 51 Pegasi B. And by comparison, right, to the, the staggering number of, of planets that have been discovered uh, outside of the solar system, the uh, progress report on discovering planets in the solar system is really kind of uh, depressing, right? Like if we were to show this picture, I think, to Galileo Galilei, you'd be like, are you guys kidding me right now, right? Adopt the telescope as a scientific instrument. You guys have 400 years and you guys only discovered two legitimate planets outside of what was known to the ancient Greeks. And then there's the whole embarrassing process of explaining that actually only one of them was really discovered um, with a telescope for after all, Right, um, the planet Uranus was is the only one that was <laughs> kind of discovered in the classic astronomical way of you know, look up at the night sky, stare all night, see if things are moving, um, and that was done I think in se uh, seventeen eighty one by uh, by Herschel, and one of the things that was immediately noticed when Herschel discovered the planet Uranus was that um, it was not following the right trajectory, right? In fact, one of the things that mathematicians of the time did almost immediately, led by um, a gentleman by the last name Lexel, was to like realize that Uranus was indeed this slowly moving object across the night sky and then go back to legacy observations and try to reconstruct the orbit of Uranus. And uh, this was, something that was done over the decades uh, following the discovery of Uranus. And it was kind of compiled, so all that data was nicely compiled in a set of tables um, by, uh, in this publication by Alexis Bovard, who was at the Parisian Observatory. And um, what Bovard nicely demonstrated is that there is indeed no way that you can tweak the the universal gravitational law, right, to match the the orbital parameters of, of Uranus over a single orbit. And you can tell that that's exactly what's going on because on the left side, you've got some sines and cosines. On the right-hand side, you've got a table with pluses and minuses. And below it is text in French, which I um, can't quite understand. But in it, uh, Bovard offers two solutions for why Uranus is not where it is expected to be if you kind of propagate its orbit due to gravity. One uh, option that Robard suggests is that, you know, being a good theorist, he suggests that the data is wrong. Uh, and second um, option, he says, we cannot rule out the possibility that there exists another more distant planet, which is actually perturbing the orbit of Uranus uh, and causing it to deviate from its predicted you know, trajectory if you are only accounting for the existence of Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus. And this is, of course, 1821. So it took a couple decades for the promise of this data set to really come to fruition. Um, but the, 
guy who is typically credited with the mathematical discovery of this perturbing body uh, from beyond the orbit of um, Uranus is Orban Leverrier, who in 1846 uh, did a beautiful, if not, uh, you know, if not, not monstrous calculation, uh, which demonstrated nicely that if indeed you introduce an extra planet into the solar system um, and put it into a specific location in, the, uh, in its orbit, um, then you can explain everything about the Uranian deviations from its trajectory. And this is kind of hailed, of course, as one of the greatest achievements of celestial mechanics because uh, the calculation of Leverrier not only predicted the existence of Uranus, but actually got the location on the night sky right to about a degree. And there's a fascinating story associated with this where uh, Leverrier gave a talk uh, in March of 1846 uh, to a bunch of observational astronomers of the time uh, showing calculations that looked presumably something like what we're looking at on the screen here. They said, well, this is cool math and all, but uh, we're, we're not gonna look. Uh, and so Leverrier sent out a bunch of letters to, to people that were his friends. And in the end, the, um, the planet was discovered by Gal, uh, who was working at a German uh, observatory on the 25th of September, uh, which was the off day for the, the director. It was director's, the director's birthday. So the director said, I'm not coming in and Gal can do, could do whatever he wanted. Um, and so the kind of remarkable you know, discovery of, of Neptune, I also like to sometimes point out, worked out so well because turns out celestial mechanics is a lot like show business in that you have to be at the right place at the right time. And clearly here, the right time mattered because both Leverrier and his contemporary Adams, who was working in Cambridge at the time, was sort of doing the same type of calculations, but got scooped by Leverrier. They both got the orbit of Neptune kind of wrong, and they all, both got the mass of Neptune wrong by a factor of two, but they got the location in the night sky correctly. And the reason this was the case is because in 1846, Uranus and Neptune happened to be close to conjunction. So what the data contained was sort of just a direction into from which this gravitational acceleration was coming from, and uh, not so much the information about the orbit per se. So it's, it's interesting to note that if you were to kind of redo the same type of calculation in 2011, which is exactly one uh, Neptunian orbital period later, their orbital predictions would be uh, quite a ways off on where, where the planet actually is on the night sky. So that's just like kind of a fun thing that I like to point out. And since then, right, since 1846, there have been no major planetary discoveries in the solar system, with the exception of the false alarm of Pluto. Now, uh, there is also a fascinating story with the discovery of Pluto, but uh, where it was initially mistaken for uh, a seven Earth mass planet. But these days we know that Pluto is not very big, right? So here we have uh, the top down view of the solar system of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the orbit of Pluto in blue. And what we now understand is that Pluto is not a bona fide planetary object. Instead, it is a member of a second, more distant belt of icy asteroids be that lives beyond Neptune. And while over the last, uh, you know, three decades, the discovery of extrasolar planets has largely dominated the kind of planetary news cycle. In parallel, there's been this staggering number of discoveries of Kuiper belt objects and really mapping out the structure of this belt of icy debris that lives beyond the orbit of Neptune. And this uh, little movie shows you more or less the orbital structure of the uh, ones that have well-characterized orbits and you can kind of naively look at it and see that, well, uh, as it turns out, right, Pluto just belongs to, is a particularly large object that belongs to this broader ring of icy debris beyond the orbit of Neptune. By the way, if uh, at any point, right, anything I say is, uh, you know, 
doesn't make sense or anything like that, please don't hesitate to interrupt me, right? We can keep this uh, going more as a, as a conversation. I'm happy to be interrupted. So uh, the discovery ask of you, the Kuiper Can I ask a question here? Yeah? Yes. Yeah, All of right. course. Of course. So this disk of the Kuiper belt seems to be quite strongly truncated in this figure. Is that just a selection effect or is that real? No, no, it's absolutely real. So the vast majority of Kuiper belt objects stop at the two to one resonance with Neptune. Okay. I mean, on the and outside. That's because, yeah, yeah, on the, out, the two to one exterior resonance with Neptune. So this is about 50 astronomical units okay. and they don't extend. Um, there, it's still actually debated uh, whether or not this truncation of the Kuiper belt at roughly 50 AU is a coincidence in the sense that that's where the solar neb the, the dust component of solar nebula ended and Neptune's two to one resonance happens to be, you know, at 47 AU, or if it's a real, you know, if it's a dynamical truncation where the kind of a large fraction of Kuiper belt objects were carried by the two to one resonance and just when Neptune stopped its exterior migration. Um, right, that's where it truncated. So uh, to answer your question, it is not a selection effect, right? Mm. The, most of this, most of the classical Kuiper belt ends um, in at 50 uh, years. I mean, amazing. Uh, right interesting. Thank uh, you. No yeah. problem. No, no, um, I could scare. Uh, Rosemary, I think. I think you're not you're not muted. So uh, oh 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 sorry sorry. I might I might, I might overhear. Uh, I might overhear. Uh, you know, if you're like, okay. Like, oh, sorry, this. it's oh, no problem. Off. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, so this is. I'm I'm glad this question of truncation uh, came up because, as it turns out, the while the classical Kuiper belt is truncated at about 50 AU, there exists another kind of population of trans-Neptunian objects that actually extends much further than, than 50 AU. And these are objects uh, that are called, that are members of the so-called scattered disk. Okay, so these are objects that come and hug the orbit of Neptune, but then swing out to arbitrarily large semi-major axes. So why is the Kuiper belt there in the first place? Well, this has been a uh, subject of kind of a reimagining of the solar system's post-nebular evolution, the fact that the Kuiper belt is there in the first place um, caused all of us to kind of rethink and realize that the solar system, the planets did not form where they are today. Instead, they started in a more compact configuration and uh, were initially encircled by a more massive sort of 20 Earth mass disk of debris and interactions between the planets and this disk of debris caused the system to go unstable and then recircularize and dynamically relax to a broader uh, orbital, a more extended orbital architecture. And so what we see as the Kuiper belt today is really the remainder of this, um, of this initial disk of 20 Earth masses, most of which was scattered away. Okay, so that's been one really remarkable kind of consequence of the discovery of the Kuiper belt is that we now know the solar system did not start out as we see it today. It underwent a transient period of dynamic instability. And this uh, movie that you just saw is not just a random movie. It's from, um, you know, from a model that uh, we did back in 2000, I think 11. Uh, and broadly, this, this class of models uh, is referred to usually as the Nice model because the uh, Nice group led by Alessandro Morbidelli is sort of the, the crew that pioneered uh, this, this way of thinking. And what we noticed is that, uh, you know, even though the classical portion of the Kuiper belt, the part that extends to 50 AU, uh, shows no interesting, you know, no anomalous structure whatsoever. If you zoom out enough, right? If you zoom out to orbits that take longer than 4,000 years to complete a single revolution. So now the orbit of Neptune is this big. And uh, back in 2015, 16, there were only four of them. Then there is something astonishing about them. Namely that even though the number of orbits is limited, they all kind of lie 
in the same plane. They're, they're all sort of tilted to the same side uh, as if the Laplace plane of the solar system has been shifted and they all swing out into the same overall direction, right? So even back in 2016, uh, we thought this was kind of a big deal and we were inspired by the work of uh, Trujillo and Shepard actually discovered, um, I think this object, which they nicknamed Joe Biden. And one interesting thing about both the object that they discovered as well as Sedna, which is the orbit shown here in purple, is that when they come close to, when they come to perihelion, so the closest approach to the sun, um, they come to 76 and 80 astronomical units respectively. So they're very removed from the orbit of Neptune, which is which means that Neptune could not have scattered them, right? Something other than the the gravity of Neptune is at play in explaining their orbits. So it's been you know a few years since 2016, and this is what the data set looks like now. So again, for scale, right? The innermost circle that you see is 30 astronomical units. That's the orbit of Neptune. And about factor of two to that is where the classical Kuiper belt lives. And this is, we're looking now at scales of hundreds of astronomical units, hundreds of times the distance between the earth and the sun. And I think you don't have to be an overly sophisticated, you know, statistician to kind of notice that there are a lot more orbits pointing down than there are up. Um, there is, I would say, one feature of this plot, which I always like to emphasize, which all, oftentimes gets ignored, but I think it's really important. And that feature is that not all of these long period Kuiper Belt objects are on the same footing. If you break them up into objects that are like Sedna, okay, and that are like this Joe Biden uh, object, things that are not strongly interacting with Neptune, in other words, ob orbits that are dynamically stable, okay, versus those that are unstable, an even more remarkable pattern comes out. The question is, where do you draw the line between stable and dynamically unstable? While the details of this work maybe are not appropriate for this talk, uh, I would invite you to check out this paper that I actually wrote with, with Rosemary uh, a few months ago, where we derive a, um, criterion on the perihelion distance, which separates the long-term stable and long-term unstable orbits. So if you apply this criterion, what you will notice is that the stable orbits cluster much better than the unstable ones do. That immediately kind of tells you that this is something gravitational. This is not an observational bias um, effect. And again, here, the purple orbits are the things that are that where if you just leave them alone in the solar system, they will slowly process, but nothing else will happen, as opposed to the green orbits, where if you leave them alone, they'll get scattered away uh, on a time scale of you know, half a billion years or something like that. So there's this pattern of clustering, which uh, in the outer solar system appears to be rather robust. So what's going on, right? Um, in the solar system, the typical thing to do is to kind of do the same thing as in cosmology, which is to maximally outsource all the interesting things to the first few million years of the solar system's lifetime. And say, well, the sun was born in a cluster, maybe a passing star flew by, perturbed the distant Kuiper belt. And we're seeing kind of the relic alignment that has come out uh, from that perturbation. And turns out that answer does not work. And the reason it does not work is that all of these orbits will process you know, on a time scale, which goes roughly as the cube of the semi-major axis. And because they all have different semi-major axes, they will process differentially and come out of alignment on a time scale on the order of 100 million years. And on a time scale of 100 million years, the probability of having a passing star uh, come and perturb the distant Kuiper belt with, you know, on a length scale, hundreds of the U is vanishingly small. Um, there are also other reasons why this can't be because we would see its signature in the cold, uh, in the so-called cold classical belt, but that's not so important. So the point is that I'm trying to make to you is that if this alignment 
of the stable orbits that we see in the in the distant solar system is real, then it's being held together right now by some extant gravitational potential. You cannot outsource it to a impulsive event. So if that's true, what can it be? Well, uh, frankly, it can be anything, right? Right? It can be a, the gravity of a very massive hamburger. It can be, I don't know, a binary burrito, right? It can be anything. But if you work through the math and ask what kind of mass and what kind of orbit do you need to reproduce the data, the mass clocks in at about Earth masses. And the orbit clocks in at something that has an orbital period on the order of 10,000 years and an appreciable orbital eccentricity. So something like 20% to 60% and something that's tilted uh, with respect to the plane of the solar system as well. And uh, you can demonstrate this by doing calculations of the type that I'm showing you here. This is just an N-body simulation of the solar system you know, four and a half billion year evolution, whereas you saw everything starts out in an axisymmetric manner. And over time, a pattern of alignment gets carved out by the orbit, by this pink object, okay? And um, the reason that this pattern gets carved out is actually simply orbital stability. If you ask, you know, what happens to the eccentricity of an orbit as you turn as it processes all the way around it goes through a maximum during orbital alignment with this fiducial perturber and during that maximum eccentricity cycle the perihelion gets jammed into the orbit of neptune and then neptune scatters it away there's this interplay between the gravity of planet nine and neptune where neptune clears out of the or the orbitally aligned object and retains the anti-aligned objects. That's why the, there's a correlation between orbital stability and alignment. Okay? These guys that are, that are anti-aligned with respect to planet nine have their perihelion removed, have their eccentricity lowered by the gravity of planet nine. So this all kind of this question of why things like Sedna, things like, uh, you know, VP 113's Biden character have lower eccentricities than expected, why they show the strongest alignment, all kind of get explained by introducing this uh, appreciably non axisymmetric potential into the outer solar system. And again, the numbers just give you something like five Earth masses to match the data, which is why we infer that it's a planet. We've never really seen the object of course, so uh, we don't know for sure what it is. Uh, it could be anything. Um, does this make sense? If there are any questions, please don't, don't hesitate to, uh, to ask. Alternatively, if you've, you've spotted a sign error or something, just let, let me know. Uh, let me know. So now. quick question, if I may. Um, so yeah. um, the point about things being kicked out, um, okay, so that suggests that essentially on a typical time scale of precession, which I think you said is order of 100 million years, um, you will get a non-trivial fraction of your objects um, uh, getting kicked out. Now, in the 4 billion years or 5 billion years of the existence mm -hmm. of the system, there were 50 such precession time scales. So basically, you have a 50 time e-folding or you know, whatever the, the appropriate fraction is, but let's say it's even you know, half of the objects get, get end up being uh, aligned and get kicked out. So you have something like, uh, you know, a 50 times two folding. So that means that there would have been two to the 50 times more objects 50 precession time scales ago. Is that uh, uh, completely naive? Uh, and if it's not, then, you know, how is it sensible yeah. to have such a large number of objects in the distant past? Okay, so all of these are Fantastic questions, and uh, the answer is uh, is effectively it, it's not quite as simple as a as an e-folding time scale, but but the basic is correct. The, the fraction of objects that we have remaining today in the distant scattered disk in this population is less than a percent of what they started out with, and that's perfectly consistent with 
with the formation story. Because as I mentioned uh, to you, to reproduce the Kuiper belt in the first place, you needed to have about 20 to 40 Earth masses of debris to drive Neptune's migration, to drive that instability that made the Kuiper belt in the first place. So if you kind of work through those numbers, you actually must eject the vast majority of the, of the distant scatter disk. Um, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Awesome. All right. So at this point, right, if we, it all seems to kind of hang together, right, we explain if we just in, do this simple thing of introducing a little planet on a slightly eccentric orbit into the distant solar system, we explain the clustering, we explain the tilt, we explain the fact that this clustering correlates with orbital stability, and we explain why there are objects with such high perihelia in the first place. But, you know, all of this is, uh, you know, standing on the foundation of this not being a observational effect. And uh, there have been, ever since the Planet Nine hypothesis has been in play, there have been sort of a steady series of papers that uh, argue that all of this is not real, right? All of this is just an observational bias. And the idea there is simple, right? These objects, live on these high, highly eccentric orbits. And in the visible, right, if you are trying to observe something, the kind of brightness of the object will scale as one over r to the fourth of the distance between the sun and, uh, and the Kuiper belt object. This is because the sun's luminosity drops by one over r squared, but then that light has to get reflected and come back to the telescope so that also as one of our uh, square. So because of this, you are preferentially going to find these objects at perihelion, um, or at least close to perihelion. So if you have a survey, which, for example, only looks over there, right, and said, okay, I'm only going to watch this patch of the sky, then absolutely you would only discover objects that are perfectly aligned because you can only discover orbits that, are, that come to perihelion there. So is that what's going on? And uh, in a recent effort, we looked very carefully at this question. And uh, the answer appears to be that, yes, there is a false alarm probability to all of this. It's about 0.4%. And the way that we did the calculation is to, uh, to not really check each survey's, uh, each individual survey's you know, footprint on the night sky because that's not known, but instead use the overall map of where distant Kuiper belt objects have been discovered generally. Because after all, if, I don't know, if Rosemary discovers a Kuiper belt object over there, right, and it has a certain brightness and it has that RA and deck, then I know that somebody looked over there and was able to discover a KBO there of such magnitude or brighter. So kind of doing that statistical exercise, we've been able to reconstruct um, the kind of bias maps for each of these uh, discoveries. And these are shown on this plot um, uh, with relative discoverable, discoverability uh, in blue. So the light blue is where you would discover these objects if, you, if this was purely a um, observational effect. And the background kind of red streak on a semi-major axis versus longitude of perihelion, which you can think of as just azimuthal direction of the orbits, right? Um, so the background red color is where you would discover, um, discover them if planet nine is there. And I think that, again, you can sort of do statistics, but you don't really have to, to convince yourself that where these objects are preferentially discovered is where uh, the um, kind of observational bias overlaps the intrinsic physical uh, dynamical uh, clustering where they're supposed to be discovered if planet nine is there. So 0.4% is the number uh, uh, to keep in mind uh, for these, you know, two lines of evidence, namely just the uh, alignment of the orbital planes, as well as the alignment of the major axes of the orbits. As well. Can now, I one of the things that I failed to do. Yeah, of course. 
Go ahead. Um, you, you, you mentioned the, the longitude of periastrum. It's actually, you've got delta omega there, and that's uh, uh, with uh, Neptune's longitude of periastrum, right? The difference between. Uh, I mean, uh, just. Oh. Sorry, uh, it's breaking. No, yeah, sorry. I yeah, I I broke up for a second. You mentioned I um, you ended but, at delta omega. So this is yeah. measured, yes, with respect to planet nines. Um, oh, you you imputed a planet nine. Yeah, on, okay. So and and just to, to say it's it's um significant that it's at pi, right? Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It, I mean, it has to be by construction because yeah. that's that's the dynamical mechanism, right? things that are close to zero get ejected by this interplay between P9 and Neptune. Yeah. And so all of the, yeah, yeah. The, no, it, it's worth commenting on. Yeah, okay, good, 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 keep going. Okay, <laughs> all right, thanks. Yeah, so one of the things I failed to do uh, is when showing this video here, um, I failed to ask you to pay attention to the fact that at the end, right, there's this, body that's like sticking out of the plane of the solar system and that's a little weird and so uh, we just kind of thought it was odd and kind of ignored it at first but um, we went back and thought a little bit more uh, about the fact that a uh, prediction that is made by every one of these calculations every time we do the the planet nine kind of set of n body simulations is that we get, we generate high inclination objects. And we thought this would be a great you know, prediction. If planet nine is really there, then you should observe this high inclination population of minor bodies in the solar system. And nobody really looks outside of the plane of the solar system. So we thought this would be a legit prediction as opposed to retrodiction. But unfortunately we fell short because when we went dumpster diving into the wise uh, data set, Turns out this population had already been discovered and just no one really bothered to make a big deal out of it. But um, indeed, as it turns out, the solar system holds a population of minor long period objects that orbit in a perpendicular manner to the plane of the solar system. And if you kind of compare the data set to where the planet nine simulations predict the objects to be, uh, it sort of matches up. There are a lot of there are a lot of observational biases inherent to this particular data set. It's much more difficult to, to redo that kind of a, a, a bias overlap uh, calculation, but I'm optimistic that with the, with the Vera Rubin telescope going online, we'll uh, you know, map out a lot more of these. And to you know, kind of draw attention to what I think is a really cool discovery is after we pointed out that Planet Nine should have these, uh, these should produce these wings to the solar system, if you will. Um, my former student, who is now once again my postdoc, um, actually discovered an object that's, that's kind of in transitioning from the primary cluster to becoming one of these uh, wings. So this is a paper from, I guess, back in 2018, led by Juliet Becker. She discovered this object, 2015 BP. Um, 519, which was, which is, you know, perfectly in the process of following those trajectories outlined on the previous uh, graph and leaving the primary cluster of orbits and joining the, the wings. So that's pretty cool. And I think that's, that's a neat um, discovery. But at this point, right, I want to take you back to 30 AU, uh, back to the, or the vicinity of Neptune. Because a few, uh, a couple of years after, or maybe it was a year after the, uh, we kind of started thinking about Planet Nine seriously, yet another mysterious thing was discovered, which was an orbit uh, immediately outside of Neptune okay, that was orbiting perpendicular to the plane of the solar system. And this is just odd, right? Because this is not something with a semi-major axis of hundreds of AU where it's in the domain where it can be affected gravitationally by planet nine, right? This is just parked right next to Neptune where planet nine exerts a negligible influence. So what's going on there? Um, 
Well, it turns out it's a bad idea to delete objects the moment they cross into interneptunian space. Because that's what we were doing in our original calculations. The moment something was crossing, developing a perihelion smaller than the orbit of right? 29 AU or so, uh, I just had an absorbing boundary condition because I think that come centaurs and eventually get perturbed by Jupiter and become Jupiter family comets. They, I understand their dynamical evolution. I don't need to do the calculation, so to speak. But redoing a similar thing to what I had shown you a few slides ago without doing said deletion actually reveals a really fascinating dynamic. So here again, you have Uranus and Neptune, it's these pink circles, uh, the big you know, purple, I guess, uh, ellipse is the orbit of planet nine. And this is just a single uh, Kuiper belt object, which is stuck in that dynamic of flipping its orbit, uh, developing periodically a high inclination, and then going back to uh, the main cluster. And one of the things that happens when it hugs the orbit of Neptune is that it can either get entirely scattered out or actually a small fraction of the time it gets scattered, gets circularized by, by planet nine. Oh, sorry, by, by the interactions with Neptune. And what we discovered is that we actually, in these simulations, reproduce a whole class of highly inclined objects that are kind of parked in the vicinity of Neptune and apparently and occasionally have perihelia actually locked to the orbit of Saturn. So once again, we went looking for a population of these objects. And once again, turns out they were in the data all along. Nobody really uh, made a big deal out of them. But there is a whole population of these highly inclined objects, um, which are shown here as points on a inclination versus semi-major axis and inclination versus perihelion distance plot. And uh, you know, the union of these two plots, I think, uh, uh, at least shows that their existence is consistent with where planet nine emplaces such objects. And that's in the background, this green kind of background 2D histogram, which shows the um, emplacement of such bodies through P9 and Neptune interactions. Okay? So again, th this is actually kind of one of my favorite lines of evidence, uh, I would say for the existence of something gravitational going on beyond Neptune, because it's kind of weird and it's you know, frankly unexpected. It was unexpected for me that the population of highly inclined bodies that straddle Neptune and Saturn are somehow linked uh, in their orbital evolution to things that take you know, thousands of years to complete a single orbital cycle. Um, any questions about this highly inclined stuff? Okay. You, uh, is it col cosi, the cosi mechanism involved? Somehow. No, no, this is, yeah, Kozai, uh, Kozai is taking a rest for a change. Uh, <laughs> Thank God for not, that. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah, no, so this is actually entirely driven by a different harmonic, which actually uh, appears at the octopole order. Mm. Uh, and uh, I read this, I, I know this because I, I used your, uh, your formalism to describe this from the 2010 paper. So, uh, uh, <laughs> So, I, so for a change, I know it's right. Uh, you know, it's uh, it's uh, it's the harmonic that is not the difference of the longitude of perihelia, but it's the other one, which has nodes in it. Mm. And actually, my uh, my former student Gonji Li pointed out to me that the physical meaning of that har harmonic is actually the retrograde difference of uh, of longitude. Perihelion. That's the thing. That's the driving dynamic which creates this this pattern. So this is not Kozai. I totally thought it was Kozai at first. Um, no, okay. Like so someplace. with all of yeah, with all of this, you know, there exists this other institute of technology that's on the east coast of the United States. Uh, it's it's not as important as the one on the west coast of the United States, but. Uh, 
you know, they they wrote a nice article about all of this, saying, you know, pointing out that with all of this level of detail, you might trick yourself into thinking that Planet Nine is easy to find, but turns out it's totally not easy to find. And the reason it's not easy to find is that it's the polar opposite of the Neptune problem. Okay, here because all in effect because all we know. Is, are the orbits of the distant Kuiper Belt objects. All we can derive is the mass and the orbit of Planet Nine. What we do not know and cannot know is the phase of Planet Nine. This is because the gravitational mode through which Planet Nine shapes all of its observed, uh, all of its observed signatures is secular. Okay? And so if you take Planet Nine and replace it with a ring of mass, uh, an equivalent ring of mass, it would give the same dynamics. As a result, right, we can't do the Leverrier thing of pointing, you know, to some point in the night sky and saying, okay, aha, there's a planet nine right there. Instead, what we're stuck with is a rather significant swath of, uh, of yeah, so to speak. Um, no, that said, we've, we've chipped away a little bit with our observational effort, um, but I'm frankly not optimistic that we are observationally particularly efficient. Okay, so I wanna spend the last few minutes of this talk talking about um, a problem that, uh, you know, a related problem which um, both Mike and I uh, pursued during the pandemic, because Mike and I like to play this game where we, when we publish a paper, we, then kind of spend a couple of days trying to make maximally make fun of our paper and try to really figure out what's wrong with it, right? Poke holes. And then one of the things that we realized was wrong in all of the analyses that we had done uh, with my minds, we kind of our calculations asserted that, that the solar system is the universe, right? But it's of course not true. The solar system is not the universe. And in fact, the sun did not form in isolation as our simulations uh, up till now had assumed. Instead, the sun actually formed in an environment sort of like this, it formed in a cluster of uh, about a thousand to 3000 other stars. We know this for a multitude of reasons, one of which is that um, meteorites show you know, an abnormal, amount of magnesium 26, which is a daughter product of aluminum 26. And of course the differentiation of meteorites, which are, which are small is attributed to pollution from aluminum 26, which was a natural consequence of stars being born in clusters. And in any case, most stars are born in star clusters. So if that's true, does that change the picture at all? Well, the answer of course, is at the detailed level, yes. And here's why. We know, so let's like, you know, let's enumerate the things that we know. We know that Jupiter and Saturn are there, right? I think we can all agree that Jupiter and Saturn are both planets that exist. And we know that the formation of Jupiter and Saturn through the runaway accretion cycle would have caused their gravity locally to go from not that important to very important. And what that process would have done is scattered away a whole bunch of debris, a bunch of icy debris that were in the Jovian and Saturnian neighborhood first. Now, if this process unfolds in a solar system that's isolated, then it's very boring. All of this debris gets scattered away to the interstellar medium and that's it, nothing else happens. Conversely, if the sun at this time is embedded in the star cluster, and it was, then something different happens. Namely, as these orbits develop long semi-major axes, they, both the tidal potential of the cluster, as well as the effect of passing stars, she will perturb and kick these orbits. And just a small kick at aphelion can strongly circular Orbit. So it moves the perihelion from the orbit of Jupiter and the orbit of Saturn, and suddenly these objects become stable. Okay, now, I didn't make this up. This is for how the inner Oort cloud is created. Okay, so the inner Oort cloud is a hypothesized population of debris that was scattered out within the first sort of 10 or so million years 
of the solar system's lifetime and then kind of frozen in through interactions with the cluster. And as the sun leaves the cluster, this quasi spherical population of bodies just gets frozen in. So the question that we asked um, and you know, answered quantitatively is, okay, what if Planet Nine is there? Can some of this material get re-injected back into the solar system? And if it does, does it follow the same pattern of clustering that we observe in the distant Kuiper belt or what, what we think is the distant Kuiper belt, right? In fact, you know, could it be possible that this distant Kuiper belt is in fact a bridge between material that is being thrown out by Neptune continuously and actually material that's being re-injected back in through interactions with Planet Nine, okay? And uh, so to do this, we had to do a little bit of work. We had to, you know, model the uh, model the cluster and model the formation of Jupiter and Saturn in the cluster. Keep track of the debris that is being ejected and then perturbed by the cluster. So at the end of the day, you have this. Uh, you know, forming, you have to basically go through the process of forming the inner Oort cloud and then subjecting it subsequently to the four and a half billion years of dynamical evolution due to planet nine. And the answer turns out to be exactly what I said, okay? Indeed, material that starts out in the inner Oort cloud and then gets re-injected back into the solar system follows the same pattern of clustering that we see for in our simulations of material that's being ejected outwards through Neptune. So this, is, this all goes to say that we don't actually know that we're looking, looking at material that's been ejected by Neptune we, because you know, none of these Kuiper Belt objects come with license plates that say, I'm an inner Oort cloud object as opposed to a Kuiper Belt object. Um, in fact, you know, what we might be looking at is the inner Oort cloud period that's been shaped by Planet Nine's gravity. And something that's, uh, that's telling, which should have been obvious to us in retrospect, but of course, you know, hindsight was always 2020. If you look at the semi-major axis distribution of these, of these plots, right? You might notice something odd. It's pretty flat, right? Like the fact that there are you know, as many objects at a couple hundred AU as there are at 500 AU, actually really weird, okay? because there is a very well-defined observational bias that allows you to find things with small semi-major axes much better than things with large semi-major axes. The fact that we observe a pretty flat distribution might be indicating that we're actually observing a distribution intrinsically, which is increasing in membership with semi-major axes. So this, this actually might be the inner Oort cloud. Now, if you by this argument, um, then it turns out at the detailed level, the best fit parameters of planet nine change. Its mass is still about five Earth masses, but unfortunately you need a more eccentric object to reproduce the data. And that's a bummer because that makes it of course more difficult to find because a more eccentric orbit likes to have an object that hangs out more at the end and stretches out to further distance anyway. So this is a, um, a complication in this entire story because of course we don't know what fraction of the objects we observe came from the inner Oort cloud, what fraction came from the Kuiper belt, etc. cetera. Um, and I will just finish by pointing out that, uh, you know, even though we haven't found planet nine, one of the most fun things about this has been that uh, a, the conductor, the Eduardo Martorell, who is the um, conductor of the Miami Symphony, got really inspired by all of this uh, business and wrote a 19 minute uh, you know, symphony about Planet Nine, sort of an extension to the, um, to the uh, you know, Planet Suite. And uh, I got to uh, kind of, play with the symphony, which was really cool. And then we made this video and we actually sent to the International Sta uh, Space Station where uh, Soichi Noguchi, who's a Japanese astronaut, listened to it uh, very carefully and politely and uh, you know, said that he liked it. 
but one of the things about you know living in 2022 is that you cannot right escape the reviews of the internet and the reviews are in and uh david Gertzman says that this is dripping with the usual self-importance and arrogance one can always expect from composers and musicians. But other than that, it was okay. Uh, and uh, Smokey McPot says, Bizarre Science, Planet Nines, meets pseudoscience, face veils. Uh, so, uh, you know, Smokey McPot uh, has, uh, you know, has their opinion and uh, you know, even got three likes. Okay. So with all of this, I think uh, I'm getting kind of close to the end of the hour. And my undergraduate advisor, Greg Laughlin, used to always tell me no scientific talk has ever er ended too early. So if you have a chance to end on the earlier side, always do. So I will just kind of enumerate uh, the lines of evidence, which I think exist for the we're pointing to something gravitational going on beyond Neptune, and they are the alignment of the orbits, the grouping of the angular momentum vectors, the fact that they're all tilted in the same direction, the excitation of distant orbits to highly inclined states, which is completely inconsistent with just formation theory of the solar system, and the pollution of the kind of interplanetary space with these retrograde centaurs that I mentioned before. Of course, the caveat that I kind of ended with is the fact that in our estimation of Planet Nine's parameters, right, we're having a hard time by not really knowing the mixing ratio of legitimate Kuiper Belt objects to inner Oort cloud objects. And that's introducing a new source of error, if you will, new source of uncertainty in our best estimates of the Planet Nine's orbital parameters. Okay, so I will stop here and take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, let's thank Constantine for his uh, for, for his amazing talk. Um, yeah, are there any additional questions? Can I ask one, Eugenie? Sure, of course. Well, actually, it's, it's two questions that are that are uh, possibly related to each other. So question one is, um, you didn't, Constantine, you didn't talk much about where uh, planet nine might come from, given its um, very unusual orbit. I mean, it's fairly massive. Uh, it's quite eccentric and it's quite far out. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, do you have any speculations about the possible channels that might have brought it there? And the second question is, during these four or five billion years of secular interactions, um, do you expect any kind of a feedback on the orbit of planet nine itself? Or is it sufficiently massive that it just uh, happily uh, essentially has an infinite reservoir of angular momentum for practical purposes, so it ejects uh, all the little guys uh, and nothing happens to it? Okay, great. Uh, so the answer to the first question, I think, is uh, well, and by I think me, I, I mean this is the most high probability channel to generating it. Is that Planet Nine is just a inner Oort cloud object? and formed through the same channel as the inner Oort cloud does. So in fact, here, I wanna give credit where it's due. Uh, Andre Isidoro, uh, who was at the time working in France, these days he's in Texas. Um, he was working in 2015 on, the, uh, on forming Neptune and Uranus from you know, colliding a bunch of five Earth mass cores, right? starting out the kind of trans-Saturnian primordial region of the solar system seeded with uh, many five Earth mass objects that then collide together and make Uranus and Neptune. And the motivation for this was to reproduce the giant impact that tilts Uranus to 98 degrees and so on. And what they found is that accretion, of course, is not 100% efficient. And often, you know, an appreciable fraction of those five Earth mass cores get scattered out by Neptune. And they actually pointed out in their paper that if the solar system is in a cluster, there's sort of a 10% chance, uh, like 10% of their ejected objects get captured at hundreds of astronomical units, uh, you know, through the same extended orbit, get perturbed by a passing star and then lock the planet in. So that appears to be the most likely um, process through which you can form planet nine. Now, as a, uh, when it comes to the feedback, 
uh, itself. It appears that the only thing that the feedback does, uh, if you start out the, uh, the disk massive, is that Planet Nine's eccentricity will go down somewhat. It is just basically dynamical friction, right? As it as it shapes its its patterns. Um, if we kind of believe the the best estimates that we have, namely that semi-major axis is you know 500 or 600 AU, it's in that region where it's not really perturbed, but currently by passing stars or the galactic tide. So over the you know modulo the first hundred million years, for the remainder of the time, it just orbits and doesn't really do anything, right? So it's orbit just slowly processes by 30 degrees over the lifetime of the solar system and that's that. Here. I think we have another question. Yeah, I think Daniel is patiently raising his hand. So uh, please. Yeah, that's all right. Um, so I was just curious, I mean, you kind of got to it to this towards the end of your talk which is that, so a flyby interaction, so a, sort of a closer encounter with another star early in the solar system's history, can explain a fair bit of the things you're talking about. So it can explain, for example, you said the inner Oort cloud is effectively these highly eccentric inclined objects, uh, but it would also tidally truncate the Kuiper belt, uh, like I was asking in the, earlier in the talk. So the question is what, what is not explained by a flyby early in the solar system? And from what I understood right. from your talk is mainly the clustering of the, uh, the perihelions. Is that correct or is there more than that? Yeah, so you, it's the clustering of the perihelia. It's the tilting, uh, the, the tilting of the angular momentum vectors, right? So mm -hmm. the clustering of the inclination and the nodes. Um, and it's the generation of the, the highly, like the highly inclined population not being just highly inclined and random, right? And just randomly distributed, but them too having a, a distinct pattern where they're sort of 70, they come to their perihelion maximum about 70 degrees off from the primary cluster uh, in either direction. We see that in the data. So that's that. Now you can also ask kind of independent of all this, right? What was the closest flyby that you could have had uh, in the early solar system uh, period, right? And um, the, the answer is that you can't actually go much uh, closer than about 300 AU. In fact, you, 300 AU absolutely is the closest you can possibly go during the cluster phase without uh, messing up the observed architecture of the cold classical Kuiper belt. And this is a paper we wrote back in 2020, uh, so before the pandemic, so infinity years ago, uh, as far as, right, uh, we know. But um, yeah, the, the fact that the cold classical Kuiper belt is so thin, right, it's this weird embedded part of the uh, Kuiper belt, which is, which actually lives uh, inside that overall donut. The fact that it's so thin, puts a pretty strong constraint. But that's assuming a dry flyby, right? So that's just a pure n-body interaction. So if you had gas involved, then that would not be true, presumably. Why, why would that not be true? Well, you can easily bring things back to the plane if you have some dissipation. Too quick. Uh, so, yeah, no, so the, uh, for these objects, it would not work because their Stokes number is so high that you would need to have gas in there for, I don't know, uh, Hubble time or something, right? These are things that have 300 uh, kilometer yeah. diameter, right? In a very wispy part of the disk. So, so they, they're tanks, they, they, don't, they don't interact aerodynamically uh, with the background gas. Okay, so you're saying you need to not perturb the classical Kuiper, what do you call it? Classical Kuiper in a cycle. Kuiper belt, yeah, it's, it's a cold classical Kuiper belt, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 100 times more object with the dynamical friction. <clears throat> Is the time for me to pipe in now? Uh, Constantin, um, I guess you're talking, it looks like you're outside the mud building and you had an office next to David Stevenson. Uh, I think he moved slightly down to the east wing. 
Uh, we have you got met, it. We, I think we met it after the Tennessee meeting in DPS. Uh, Dave once suggested there might be rogue planets out there. And I find I'm happy to accept if it's discovered, of course it exists, but I don't understand Planet Nine being as like a part of the sun's natural family. Um, so I'd look on your Planet Nine as being an interloper. That's uh, one point I'd make. The other point, I remember a very spirited meeting of the DPS in Pasadena 2016. Uh, Bill Faulkner and I, maybe it was Jacobson got up and they were really uh, throwing the book at you. Um, oh, yeah. Does that settle down a little ways or uh, what, have, have the, has a truce been re reached up there at 4800 Oak Grove Drive? That, that's my interest. Yeah. Well, Andrew, I'm glad you asked because uh, the answer is this, actually. Uh, the, the Faulkner et al. and company JPL Ephemerides can land, you know, can land something on Mars with extraordinary precision. But that's, that is because they have tuned every parasable to, right, to precisely reproduce the Ephemerides. So the group, uh, let, you know, led by Anias Fienga uh, at Nice, what they did is they constructed a, an ephemeris, ephemeris from scratch and said, okay, let's not fit for the mass of, rather, let's not, you know, assume that we know anything about the mass of the asteroid belt or the Kuiper belt, all of these things, and just fit all the data. And this is all the Mars orbiters, Juno, and importantly, Cassini. So Cassini turns out to be the most important um, driver for this. And, and asked, where can you put Planet Nine uh, in the solar system and A, destroy the spacecraft trajectory such that you can't match the data? Or alternatively, where can you put Planet Nine and uh, have a better match? to the ephemeris than you, know, than you would expect. So the answer turns out to be that, uh, and it's, it's summarized in these, these plots, which are maybe a little bit on the difficult side uh, to read, but effectively where uh, th there exists portion, portions of the sky where if you put planet nine there, your match to spacecraft trajectory gets marginally better. It's not good enough to like really warrant you know, a claim for a detection. It's only a few percent or something like that. But uh, if you do the calculation from scratch and carry through your, um, you know, carries through your errors properly, which is what they did in this 2020 paper, right? You get both constraints, namely you can't put Planet 9 at 300 AU, you would see that signal in uh, Olsen. But if you put it at 600 AU in, kind of certain portions of the night sky, your ephemerides get a little bit better. And turns out the portion of the sky where they get better actually kind of aligns with, with where aphelion is for the derived orbit. So those two things, again, I'm not going to like jump up and down and say, oh, this means you know, so much, but at least it, it's a, there's a consistency check that uh, you can, uh, you know, you can put half planet nine and get away with it, right? And even get a slightly better match to the space god data. Well, th thanks, uh, Constantine. Yeah. Um, no, you... thanks for that question. Yeah. Sure. Good. We'll catch yeah. up again. Thank you again. So uh, we wish we've, we actually passed the hour. So let's finish the formal stuff. I'm going to stop the recording, but, but let's thank Constantine again. And people are welcome to stay longer to, you know, informally chat. Yeah, for sure. Thank you.